Essendon winning their first flag since 1965. This is Cyrus Sarah with the uh, game, and uh, Essendon the premiers for 1985 winning two in a row. Away goes Michael Long. who emerges with the football. Some icing on the cake. Oh, what a finish. Head! Head! The fairy tale's complete after a horror week. James Head, you are a genius. Well, footy is here again for 2020. Even though we'll be apart on game day, we're in this together. New faces... Familiar faces. There's plenty to like. Dev's tackles. There's the tackling machine. That's how you do it. Waller's wizardry. He goes the little shimmy and kicks the right for goal. Sardi's dash and dare. Magnificent. Jakey's miraculous goals. And from 55, he lines up and goes. Bang! Right through the middle. We've put in the work. Now it's time to go again. It may look different, but your role is more important than ever. What do we do when the Bombers kick a goal? The mighty moments we strive for. Sing the song. Get excited, Bomber faithful. The mighty Bombers are back. Red and back. Well, it's hard not to get excited. That is uh, Essendon captain Dyson Heppel with news uh, last week that footy is back. Uh, It's still a few weeks away, but uh, nonetheless, you can't help but get a little bit excited. The fact that the uh, the 2020 season will recommence uh, very shortly with Essendon starting at one win and no loss. And that's uh, quite important as well. Adam White with you for working through it. Uh, the, The big guns aren't too far away. Xavier Campbell, James Hurd and also Joe Watson. But just a reminder for Essendon fans of of what he's coming up today. A very special interview with Bruce McAvaney. Now, we have to be open and transparent here that uh, both uh, James and Joe caught up with Bruce yesterday. And uh, it goes for over half an hour and uh, you won't want to miss it. Uh, the chat with uh, Bruce McAvaney. Blake Carousella will also uh, join the guys a little bit later on. That will be live. Um, so if you've got any questions uh, for Blake, uh, fire them through uh, on 0416 90 50 52. And we'll try and get a couple of them through to Blake when we chat with him. But I think most importantly this morning, this is all thanks to Coles, uh, who are a great supporter of the Essendon Football Club. We are going to give away five $150 Coles gift vouchers today to the best text messages, the best questions that come through on the show, 0416 90 50 52. All you have to do is sit, uh, simply text your questions in and we'll put the guys in the hot seat, Xavier, Job and Hurd, and I'll ask the questions. They won't know what they are and uh, they've got to give... Uh, Honest answers, most importantly, but quick answers. So we'll do that a little bit later on after we've spoken to both Bruce and Blake. So that's to come on Working Through It on this Wednesday afternoon. Let's uh, welcome in the team. And we keep talking about how busy Xavier Campbell is as CEO of Essen, and I think that's just gone up a notch after what's happened over the last week. Uh, Xavier, welcome. Good afternoon, Whitey. Thanks for having me again. Good to be back. You've got a bit of a different backdrop today. It would mix things up a bit. When I'm I am on different locations today. I'm, I'm at my parents' house today. Oh, very good. Up in the country. Oh, yeah, nice. so you said it. Yeah, things have, have they got busy? I'm not sure they've actually got busier. Not for me. I think it's sort of, uh, I'm not one of the 25, so it's, sort of, it's, a, it's a funny sort of feeling, to be honest, because it sort of felt like there was a bit of a build-up into Monday when the guys came back to training. But obviously it's something that, um, you know, for the executive, say for Dan Richardson as, as a GM of footy, but for the executive and the rest of the, the admin, you sort of, we're isolated from the football department. So it's, um, I was able to watch it for a period across from my, from my balcony down there and watching them train. It looked very, very different out there given the, the protocols and the new structures that put in place. But um, certainly having spoken with everyone Monday night, Tuesday night, there was, there was real excitement from the players and the staff to be back, albeit slightly different environment to what they'd, what they'd left in, um, in March. Now, I'm going to steal one question. Have you had a COVID test? Do you have no, to I have haven't. One? Yeah, you don't no, I haven't. So. Oh, okay. No, I don't. No, not unless I go into the 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 list of twenty five or when it, they get the return to matches, which is unlikely. I don't think I probably need to be. You've got um, we've got uh, Lisa Laurie, our uh, GM of People and Culture, and Dan Richardson essentially 
they're the two senior people within our football program, very very capable, very comfortable with them managing all through that. So uh, my role, will be, I'll be involved in a lot of the football meetings because essentially all the, all the meetings still need to be virtual meetings, basically. Um, so you're still involved in a lot of those meetings, but ultimately the face-to-face stuff will be done by them on the ground. So unless that changes, I won't need to. All right. Uh, James Hurd uh, is a part of the team as always as well. Hurdy, when you heard the news that, that footy was back, how did that make you feel? Oh, well, he good to be on the show, and uh, thanks. Oh, I was very, uh, very excited, and um, great to hear Dyson Heppel's voice in the, in the pregame. Um, watching the news, a bit of the news last night. Um, great to see him running around and changing direction. Because I think it was a period of time, seven or eight weeks ago, when when round one was around, that we we're all a bit worried that you know how his season was going to go. So great to hear his voice, but even better to see Dyson. Um, Running around the grass, changing direction and testing that foot out because uh, if the Bombers are going to go anywhere this year, he's a hugely important part of the team. Yeah, absolutely. And rounding out the three as uh, you guys take over, uh, Joe Watson, welcome. And I can't wait for you and Herdy's. It's not really a one-on-one interview with Bruce, but it's like uh, the parents are away and the kids get the chance to, to chat to Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, Whitey. It um, it was a, a really enjoyed the interview, and, and Bruce was um, was really open, and um, we have to thank him for um, giving you his time and and the stories that he told, and and Herdy and I we, we really enjoyed it, and just um, sat back and listened to. I mean, he's had an extraordinary life, and he's met you know he's been in rooms with um, you know if you're a sports fan the biggest names in world sport over a long period of time. And um, he talks a bit about that and then opens up about his own journey um, in broadcasting and, and how he went through some difficult periods as well. So it's a, it's a really enjoyable um, interview and I got a lot out of it as well, but it's um, I suppose we're starting to crank uh, the machine back up um, Xavier and, and footy is back. Um, We've got a firm date um, have you? How have the players been in terms of um, their excitement and and co- in talking with you? How happy are they to be back playing or at least training with a with a firm date to to move ahead? Yeah, I mean, getting that certainty is obviously invaluable for the guys. As much as you know, we, we'd actually said to the players probably three or four weeks ago, we, we gave them some dates that we thought we might be returning to training. We actually by by chance we said the. Um, the Monday date, and um, I think we told them to, to be ready to play by about the, the 8th or 9th of um, June, so we're not miles off there, but I think once it becomes definitive, they then can start working toward a particular date, and it's not necessarily doing a pre-season, and they've done their pre-season, it's obviously sharpening up now, it's getting back into the education and back into a rhythm again. I think that rhythm, you know, you know as well as anyone, like when you, that, the rhythm's taken away from you, it becomes really challenging, particularly for guys who are used to being in it and have been in that system for so long, so... I think they're pretty they're pretty excited about what what they've got ahead, and I mean we're we're lucky we've got a, we've got a brilliant facility like you, you know you guys have seen it. It's it's having two training grounds and a really significant size around our indoor training hall. We've got a really large gym, so it does offer us some and afford us some benefits around our scheduling and programming um, that perhaps other clubs might not have the luxury of at the moment because it's a, it's such all of it's about the protocols around confined space and things like that, and having that four square meter. Um, vicinity around each person, so um, I think there's a, there is a there is a genuine sense of excitement for football to be back. The guys aren't taking it for granted, but they're definitely excited about it. And Xavier, from a, I've heard a lot of the coaches talk about what they're going to focus on with their players. Some are talking about cohesion, some are talking about um, fitness and, and making sure that you know there's no soft tissue injuries. What's the Essendon Football Club's point of view on? If you've only got three and a half weeks, do you spend more of your time on, on tactics and cohesion or more of your time on the physical conditioning of your players? Uh, I think it's more the former. And it's probably a good question for uh, Caro when he comes on, um, Hurdy, later on, because he's obviously at the coal face. He's, he's much closer to it to me. But I know that clearly you know, we, we've sort of always said when, when bringing Caro in last year, it was very much about Ben working with new defensive structure and process. This year, obviously, Cara's been involved and with, with Wusher and Ben working on a new offensive piece to sort of complement the defensive and, and look to try and connect the two in a bit more of an effective way. And I'd imagine that's still going to be the, the big focus for our guys. Connection has always been a part that Ben, John and Blake and the rest of the coaching group are really keen to keep building, and that's obvious because it's when you build strong connection it takes care of a, a lot of aspects that are important to your football program. So, yeah, it would be a good question for Cara, but I know that um, that education piece is going to be massive for them over the next four weeks as a lead into the season. 
And I think the the big one that everyone's waiting for is the is the draw. I mean, who do we play round one? Who do we mm. who do we play round? Sorry, round two. Who do we play round three? Are we going to get a, a, an easy draw at the start? I, I imagine that um, you would have been flicking off uh, plenty of text messages to the AFL, pleading that we get a, a good draw, as every other club uh, is doing. Do you have any indication of you know who we play in our first four or five rounds? No, I don't. To be honest, and that's that's being brutally honest. And I. I Shot a text message to Travis all last night to sort of try and get some insights, and he wasn't forthcoming. Uh, I'd expect that maybe we should have got Travis back on the show again this week to let you two sort of get stuck into him and try and suck something out of him. But I'd expect that later this week we'll get to we'll have some conversations with the AFL or over the weekend around what the fixture looks like. It's very different. I mean, normally we put we put forward a fixture submission. You know, in probably October the year before, and we put a lot in around. Obviously, there's some football performance elements, and so that's mostly around six day breaks and things like that, where you're trying to minimise that to 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 help with team performance. There's a piece around interstate travel, all those sorts of things, but a lot of it is around the commercial aspects of. And for a club like us, and you guys know as well as me, like we've got some really big blockbuster fixtures that we've worked hard on over the years to build, and they're really really important for for our football club for a whole range of different reasons. That sort of is a little bit different now when you come into a fixture where you're not having crowds, things like that. Um, but I'd imagine that in the first four weeks of the fixture, and they're going to they're going to release the fixture, I think, in rolling four week blocks. I think you'll see a lot of the teams up in Queensland will probably go. I assume will be playing each other um, up there for that period of time, and a lot of the Melbourne based teams uh, will be playing each other and, and potentially up against the New South Wales based teams. So it's sort of. It's probably easy to sort of say that we have a particular group of about 12 teams in Melbourne that we'll be playing our games against in the first four weeks that you could choose from. And, and Xavier, just um, in your discussions, I know you talk um, closely with a lot of players. Uh, is there any sort of nervousness or trepidation or anxiety with them coming back to um, training or getting ready to play with a different type of um, leading? You know, like there's not only guys... Um, are trying to prepare themselves for a, a season off a much different break than what they're normally used to, but also in circumstances in an environment that is um, is one full of anxiety for everyone. Have, have they? Yeah. How are they feeling as a playing group? Yeah, I, I think they're pretty good now, um, Joe. Particularly with that sort of the more definitive piece around the playing and what playing looks like. Like a lot of their their questions have have sort of been answered in this last week. And that, has, that goes an enormous way to giving them comfort, I think. Whereas if you'd asked me three weeks ago, before we had real visibility on or four weeks ago, um, I think there was sort of, it went in waves. Like you sort of, when you, you talk to different players, you know, every week you, know, you sort of keep contact with the, with the leadership group and the senior leaders within the football program. And there's different concerns from different groups, but it sort of seems to flow differently throughout it. Um, and they're just... When there's that uncertainty, I mean, we've found it at different points in our, over the last five or six years that the periods of uncertainty are the hardest to manage. It's when you've got, even if you've got some bad news, but you've got clarity around dates or processes and things like that, it, it's, in my experience, it's made it easier to manage through. Um, and now that we've got those dates, I think there's a, we've worked really hard this week in our messaging to the entire playing group and the staff that as much as we might have some definitive dates in front of us, we still have to be prepared for change. Like we just don't know how the external landscape will shift or if there's going to be an infection in a particular club, if it's going to halt things. Like we, and we have to be prepared and we have to be embracing of the potential for further change down the track, as hard as that might be. Because you know, ultimately the clubs that do that the best, that embrace that the most, will be clubs that benefit from a competitive standpoint, I think. So, uh, and that's something we've really drilled into our players throughout the past week in particular. Just quickly, Xavier, from a, a sports administration and you who've been so heavily involved in the footy club, will you um, look upon reflecting upon this year differently if, if for example, S- Essendon would be to win the flag? Would you view it any differently? There's been a lot of commentary about does it have to carry the same weight as what a normal season would? In your opinion, mm. uh, is it is it different or... Would you still view it as we were the best team, we won the flag under extraordinary circumstances that was faced with everyone and, and we move on? Yeah, I think you'd be naive to say it's not different. Like, it's absolutely, it's different. Um, but I don't think that makes it any, I don't, I don't think it would make it any less important if you won the premiership. In fact, it's probably, a, it's a more hard-fought 
premiership maybe because of the different obstacles that you would have had to have na- navigated through for every single club. And to, I guess it gets back to my point before that some clubs will, na- will probably navigate through better than others. That's just the nature of it. And that will go a long way to better position them when it comes to their on-field performance, I'd imagine. And I hope for us to be one of those clubs. And you know, perhaps having success this year would be a great token and respect for the way that the clubs have embraced and managed that. So it's as, it feels like this year is as much about mental as about physical and, and football um, more than anything. And I don't think, you know, I don't think I want to, I, I would sure our members would want to hear that. And I know that I've definitely seen that in our playing group, but that's, that that's how they see it. It'll be different and it'll feel different and it won't be perfect at every different juncture. There's going to be a different sort of twist or turn that we're probably not expecting. And that's just, and I think everyone's seen that in their own lives. I think people are seeing that in all the different industries, there are all the all the different articles you read throughout the day. Even for just you, know, you read the financial review for review, for example, and just the the impact on different industries is enormous. And ours is no different. But I feel I feel confident that um, it'll ha- it might have an asterisk on it, but it'll have an asterisk that, that really underlines how hard fought and determination and everything else that's required to get clubs there to win a flag this year. And it won't be any less important than, than previous years. Well, Xavier, I've uh, caused a bit of a stir here. As soon as I said that we're giving away Coles vouchers, uh, the text message machine is almost broken. There's about, oh, I don't know, 50, 60. They've all come through on 0416 90 50 52. Keep texting 0416 90 50 52 and we'll sort of sieve through them and, and come up with the best 10 to ask uh, you guys a little bit later on. But Xavier, our first guest today, I know that there are a lot of Essendon fans that were so excited that he has returned to the football club and I speak of Blake Carris and uh, he's uh, on the line to talk to us on working through it this uh, this afternoon. Yeah, obviously he's a familiar face and familiar name for for all the Essendon faithful. But um, you know, it's been great to have him come back to our football club this year. I mean, it's it's, it's nice that he's an Essendon person, but that's not why we, we went and got him. If I'm being brutally honest, we went and got him because he's he's a really good football coach, and that's um, that feedback was was really strong across all the different people we spoke to. Not least, obviously, Dan Richardson who had worked really closely with Blake at uh, Richmond and obviously Ben Rutten. So it's been great to have him join the footy club again in the coaching role and um, I think he's enjoyed his first few months. So uh, welcome, Blake, and how's it all going? Yeah, thanks, Xavier. Um, had a great time. Um, yeah, starting, I guess, uh, way back in the start of November and uh, meeting all the, the players who I didn't know all about, to be honest, and uh, probably more the, the coaching staff. Um, and the old, the old timers that have been around for, for a long time Killer, killer on the dock. Um, and yeah, that's been really, really exciting. Um, you know, putting in uh, new processes, and I think uh, the fans would have seen through the uh, pre-season games, going over to West Coast and, and playing against them, and also Geelong, who are you know, two really good teams and have been for a long time. And then playing around one and betting three. Um, yeah, it's a great start to the year, and hopefully it can continue now that we're back into uh, the swing of things. Carol, it's, it's Hurdy, and uh, first of all, congratulations on the reputation you've forged in, in the coaching ranks. For a number of years, you know, people have been speaking very highly about you and um, you know, what you've done at Richmond and, and uh, is quite remarkable. I wanted to throw a few names at you. Kevin Sheedy, Lee Matthews, Mick Malthouse, Chris Scott, Damien Hardwick, all premiership coaches. You're coached by three of them. I think you coach with two of them. Um, are you more a Sheedy coach, a Matthews coach, a Malthouse coach? What, what's, uh, where do you get most of your influence from, or is it all you? Uh, great question. You left out Bomber Thompson as well. Um, probably a lot. Uh, I think you're always true to yourself. At the same time, you, you learn as you go through life, and uh, Sheedy was my first coach. and I think those, uh, those coaches from the early years, Sheedy, um, Lee, Nick, come from the old school, um, probably a, a bit tougher as coaches, but they also still had that soft side as well, whereas now, um, and you know, the, the generations have changed as well, so um, certainly new coaching techniques being in, implemented, but also the way, um, I guess, people manage uh, the players and staff, um, a lot more inclusive now, and um, yeah, so who I, who I learn off the most, uh, I don't know, I didn't answer that question, I think I've, I've taken bits and pieces of of all those coaches, and not so much the coaches, but the, the cultures and, and the way the teams have operated, um, whether that be on field or off field, and, and uh, have tried to, to learn from, especially the teams who were going really well, uh, Essendon through, you know, the 2000 year that we were part of, uh, the Brisbane team, Collingwood, which long. So they've been quite lucky. 
lucky to be um, around you know, really good teams and, and cultures to learn from. And when I, when Brendan McCartney came over from Geelong to us, I think you've coached for a couple of years with Brendan, he, he said your, your ability to analyse the game from a statistical point of view and then, then simplify it was, was something that he was incredibly impressed by. Is that the way you started with, with analysing from a statistical point of view? Because playing with you always seemed like you had a great football brain. I mean, I've never, I, the, the only player I play with is able to create that much space out of nowhere and, and always find yourself in space. So it was, it was in game knowledge, but also that analysing of analysis statistics that gives you that advantage that the way you are now. Um, I think I was probably lucky as a player. I didn't have much athletic ability. I had to um, work out where the ball was going before the other players did so to, to succeed. But um, I think you, you, you probably, I guess, devise a, a way of looking at the game when you're young as a player. And uh, I kind of fell into coaching really when I broke my neck and um, got offered a job at Collingwood. Um, but no, I, I tend to look at the game and, and uh, kind of compare it to how you, um, I guess, how you have thought about the game, where the game's at. But at the same time, you, you know the game's going to change. And I've been in the game coaching for 12 or so years now. It's changed quite a lot. Um, but the fundamentals still remain the same. Um, so when you do look at a game, look at whether it's uh, offence or defence or stoppage, and you get a kind of a, a, a feeling of um, or a thought of... Uh, how the game should be played or, or how we are playing it. But then you go back to the stats to just to support that view and then um, try and find a way forward. And, and Blake, um, thanks for, for joining us. I'm just uh, curious to get um, your thoughts on how the group had been progressing over the summer. I know um, it's it's sort of a small sample size and difficult to know where I think everything was tracking with limited um, exposure to games. But... From your experience, just from the start of pre-season to where we were, um, you know, after that round one game, what you'd seen in terms of the development of what you're trying to implement and, and who had impressed you and, and where you think it's going to go um, once games start back up? Yeah, I think, um, I think we've come a long way, really. Um, you know, I think I said before, like, the, the supporters and fans would have seen us play and probably noticed a slightly different uh, version of the way Essendon play. Um, we... We started with the fundamentals way back in November and slowly, uh, I guess, um, incorporated some systems into our play. And uh, when you look across the league, all the systems are quite similar. It gets back to how you coach the, the fundamentals to get the traction. Um, they're, they're, and to the players' credit, you, you don't get very far unless the, the players are open to, to learning and, and to improving. Um, and when we started, we only had the first, uh, I guess, the first of all year players, and their attitude was fantastic. And we had McGrath and Parrish and all those types of players. I think Snelling was, was there, you know, as a young player going places. Um, and to see those uh, those players with the right attitude and then and learning, and and I guess it's easy sometimes when I come across from a successful club, as I did with Richmond, they're all ears and they want to learn and they want to get better and and they want to win. Um, and that's the most important part. So, uh, yeah, those, those first three games against West Coast, Geelong and, and Frio, um, we won them all in, in different ways as well. It was a wedding uh, Perth and, and Geelong um, uh, was out at uh, Colac playing up there and then back um, round one with no crowd and, and a whole new situation. And uh, we kind of got tired in the last quarter, but we, we hung on. Um, so... Uh, it's great to be back now, six or seven weeks away from the club and um, spending time with your family is always fantastic. But getting in, uh, it's like your first day back at school. All, all the players are catching up and, um, uh, and the same attitude, really. They, they were back out training and, and looking forward to improving and, and playing uh, round two. Now, Cara, we're going to put you on the spot and we want a really honest answer here. We've got... We've been talking for the last eight weeks about when we're coming back, who's coming back, hubs, you know, really all Essen supporters want to know is who's going well, um, who's blitzing up the track and who's fit and who's not. Can you give us something just for the Essen supporters out there to give them some hope? Who, 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 who's shown up after eight weeks off looking the best and, uh, and who's improved their injury status um, as, a, as opposed to where they were eight weeks ago when the season closed out? A yeah, great question. We've only had the players back for two days. Um, but uh, the first person that stood out for me was uh, Andy McGrath. He looked like he's even fitter than what he was um, 
in the, in the pre-season and uh, yeah, we're trying to work out where to play a lot of our players and the new systems and I'm trying to learn about the players and work out what they really can do and what they can do in the future and, and what time we need to spend developing players in different areas. But um, uh, Tip and Woody, I, I think, is just a fantastic player. Um, he creates something every time he goes near the ball, whether it's an offence or defence. Um, you know, I really like like the look of him. Um, I mentioned Will Snelling before. Uh, hasn't played many games, but I think he's going to really fit into into the way we play. Um, so there's quite a few players. Um, I think we're quite we're quite even across the board through the midfield. Um, it's probably going to be a strength one day. We still need a lot of work through there, but um, we'll certainly uh, be trying our best to, to make sure that all parts of the ground are, are strong. Um, yeah, and uh, looking forward to who we play round two. Who knows who's, who's uh, or what, what the fixture is for round two, three, and four. But uh, looking forward to the uh, the challenge that it, that it may bring. And and Cara, just um. Wanting to know, you, you obviously were there when when Richmond sort of changed the style of the way games were played. When they probably went for um, ball in motion all the time, um, with a lot more fleet-footed players and speed. I'm just curious to, th- to where the next direction of where footy you think is going, and, and whether or not um, there's going to be another shift um, to a different style and uh, away from perhaps so much speed um, on the ground and, and whether it might be a contrasting style um, moving forward or whether you think it will continue to develop where these sort of smaller players but um, a lot more leg speed on the ground will be more effective um, as as the game moves into the next couple of years? Yeah, great question. I think the game's always changing. Um, there's always a way to play to beat the last, uh, I guess, method and, uh, and this current... Um, or the current Richmond model that'll uh, eventually be overwhelmed by a different way of playing again. It goes full circle. So if you look at the, the history of the game, um, I guess look the past um, really dominant teams, I guess you look at Geelong and the way they started to handball, handball backwards and then go forward with the ball and they, they really changed the game with the handball. Um, then Hawthorne came in and um, started kicking the ball around a lot as well. Uh, the defence has changed from probably sitting back in defence to really pressing forward and uh, Collingwood, St Kilda, Collingwood, Geelong. Most teams tried to press across the last 10 years. That's actually starting to stop and teams are realising um, when to press and when not to. And um, So the game's getting a bit more complicated as, as we go. But um, as I said before, the fundamentals of the game still remain the same. You have to be able to get the ball first, win the ball and then use it, move the ball down the ground and then try and score. Um, so where the game's going, it's, it's really hard to predict. But if you keep your, I guess you keep your, um, you keep watching, keep, keep your foot on the pulse, um, you, you know eventually that um, you either stay ahead of the curve or you stay right behind the first person to move or the first team to move and get that advantage, and you can then uh, hopefully move with them and um, and then try and get in front. Now, Cara, we can't finish with a couple of, without. Um couple of memories of you as a player and my first memory of you as a player was uh, at Cross Keys um, in a practice, inter-club practice match you know, just after January and uh, I think we were both playing in the middle of the ground and um, Sheesh came to me about half, at the end of the first quarter and said to me, Herdy, why, um, why is the bloke you're playing on getting all the ball? And I said, oh, is he? I didn't know he was. That was my general attitude. I didn't know who I was playing on. But after I started watching you and trying to find you, you see... Yeah, it was for 15 years, Herdy. I know, I know. But you, you kept getting to the other side of the ground and it seemed to be one of your great, your great strengths was that the board was on one side of the ground and you, you were Traffic to 300. Get out, get out to the other side of the ground, which from that moment, I think we all thought uh, in your first year that you are definitely going to you know, contribute to the club and then, and then go on to be a very good player. The second um, anecdote I want to put across, though, and more importantly, was, was one of off-field. Um, bottle tops, does that mean anything to you? Uh, sorry, I missed the whole that. I just got cut off on that. <laughs> 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 all, all I had was uh, cross keys, and I do remember the game because I, I was a young kid and hadn't played uh, any senior footy, and I remember playing on on James in a, in a practice. I might have been a training girl, a practice game, and you know the, the challenge of the, the the enormity of the challenge for a young kid to play on on Eddie. Um, I remember uh, had a, had had a few kicks. I'm not sure what two. Um, Said to Jimmy, I cut off, but um, I certainly remember the occasion. You had plenty of kicks, but the the punchline of the joke, like, 
was bottle tops. Does that make anything clear? <laughs> um, yeah, back back in the younger days, um, people spread lots of uh, untruths about my um, my counting of bottle tops. <laughs> I remember we checked in your pockets one day and there's plenty of bottle tops in there but anyway we'll tell that story another day but uh, congratulations mate on, on getting back to the club and what you've done in your coaching um, coaching resume so far and I think everyone at Essendon is very excited to see what you and the, the guys are going to do with the club this year and it just feels like as a coaching group you, you, you're going to define a game style and uh, and I think that's the way you judge a good a good coaching group their team is um, you know playing the game style it's very well defined so well done and we look forward to great success this year and for years to come yeah thanks Jimmy I think um, we're very lucky we've got a really good coaching group that um, complement each other they get along really well we've only been together for you know, four, four, five, six months now but we do get along well um, we share ideas and uh, that's the, the first part of uh, being a good coaching uh, group and Blake Carousella joining us on Working Through It on this Wednesday, and we thank Blake very much for his time. It's pretty cool to have Blake and uh, and Herdy talking about uh, what it was like back in that golden era of uh, around 2000, uh, Herdy and Blake. Such a, a good combination to watch, Xavier. Um, as an Essendon fan, uh, Herdy and, and Blake, inside 50, forward of centre, very dangerous. Some smart players there, isn't he? Weren't they? Oh, um, he's pretty. He's a he's a, a deep thinker, though, Blake, isn't he? Hurdy. He's. Um, it was the first thing when I, I hadn't met Blake before, whenever it was last year, it was September, October last year, when we first started talking to Blake and, um, and Dan Richard, Richardson introduced me to him, and he just he really thinks about doesn't waste many words, and that's um, he adds enormous amount to our to our coaching group because of that diverse thinking that he's got. Absolutely, deep thinker and just an incredibly smart footballer. I mean, he, um, he used to be able to find space to see anyone on the ground, and he and I had the same sort of thought. The ball would go in in one side of the ground, you'd get it the other side, you'd, you'd get the ball. And before Blake came along, I'd normally be out there on my own, so I could get the ball. And then I look around, and there's Blake standing next to me. I was like, hey, "You're using my trick." And he was, uh, you know, he was in his first year, and I was a ten-year player, but but a terrific player. And I think one of the the regrets that Kevin Shee um, has targeted that you know, the club made was really, and probably the, the end of the, the era was when when Blake and um, and, and and Justin Blumfield and Chris Heffernan left, and, and not only did we lose uh, quality players who, who really were smart thinkers and should have been the next generation of Essendon, but we lost great people. Um, Blake was mm-hmm. a fantastic club man, as was Chris and as was um, as was Justin. So, and, and Damien Harbick as well at the same time. So. That was a, I think I can't remember what it was, 2002, 2003, but that was a, a very disappointing uh, era, a part of the, the club. But um, yeah, Xavier, just I know we've got to go to a break. I know Bruce McAvaney is coming on, but I just want to change tact a little bit and, and just talk about our membership. Because one of the things I, I saw during the week was that there's not criticism of the AFL, because I, I wouldn't be the person to criticise the AFL, but their, their membership that if you are a, a long term member and you can't pay for that membership going forward, you lose your continuity, you know. So if I'm a 20 year member and I don't sign up, then I go back to a one year member. The benefits that come with that is that the same at Essendon? Because uh, to me, that feels very harsh. Um, and I would hope that Essendon fans would, you know, if you can't afford it this year, um, as much as we all want Essendon to be, people to be members, it's such an important part of the club. But it does feel that hopefully the club is um, is looking after members a little bit better than that. Yeah, I'm not across ex- exactly the the AFL membership offer, but I know I think something I mentioned last week. I know from our perspective, um, you know, we we want to create optionality for our members. You know, it's a unique year, it's a challenging year, so we want to ensure we cater for everyone because everyone has their own personal circumstances. So, you know, clearly, we would love for members to maintain their membership this year, and we've got um, uh, you know, there's different options from upgrades for next year, sign jumper of the player of their choice right through to tax deductibility, all those sorts of things. But then there's, there's the option of just choosing a credit for next year or, you know, if, if a member's not in the position to be able to continue this year, there's the opportunity for a refund. But one of the underlying elements of our membership offer is regardless of whichever option you choose, whether you choose to maintain your membership, you choose a credit or you choose, you think that you, you want to get a refund this year, we don't want members to lose 
their consecutive years of membership, nor do we want them to lose their reserve seats. I'm not sure how that compares to the AFL piece, and I don't want to compare. They're all very different, obviously. But um, I know that was a piece that when we spent a lot of time talking about this as the executive and presenting it to the board, that was the board's overwhelming feedback was we want to, build, we want to maintain basic elements that are important to our membership regardless of whatever they choose. And that's what, what, what we've been able to do. And we'll, we'll launch that this evening. I know we spoke last week. as a bit of a soft introduction to it through a letter from the president. We discussed it on the podcast last week. But, um, you know, for us, we'll go live tonight. And that doesn't mean every member will receive it tonight. I think we sort of said because of the enormity of our member base, it'll be staggered over the next week. Um, but hopefully... Um, Members see that value and they and they can maintain their membership this year because you know it means an enormous amount. I mean, I'm sure you guys know how much the membership. I mean, you guys both also understand the structure of the football club. You understand the importance of the membership piece. So you you would know that um, without that, it becomes a really difficult challenge, particularly financially. But that flows onto investment into our football program, into our community, into a whole range of other areas as well, obviously. All right, so we might uh, get onto that a little bit later on as well when some of the text messages come through from Essendon members that might have questions uh, around membership for Xavier. But we are going to take a very short break, uh, reset and come back with the the feature interview with uh, Bruce McIvaney. You are listening on the Essendon website to Working Through It. Ball back into play again as it goes wide towards the half, or over the half forward line for Hawthorne. There's the Cyrus Sarah to win the uh, game, and uh, Essendon the Premiers for 1985, winning two in a row. Okay, so don't forget those text messages, 0416 90 50 52. As I said, we're being inundated with them and some really good questions are already coming through. We will do that a little bit later on, but uh, it is time to listen to Bruce McEvaney. In fact, before we do, uh, Herdy has got something he'd like to say. I can, I can see him in his office. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Whitey. We just, we just, um, there's something we missed because, because Joe and I, we interviewed, um, Bruce, uh, yesterday, yesterday before the show. And, you know, obviously he is the doyen of, of, uh, South Australia, started South Australian, South Australian radio. And Joe, you had some interesting perspective on, on one of our, uh, panelists who've actually been a radio show host and actually thinks he's a rival to maybe Bruce McAvaney. Is that true? Yeah, it, it was interesting just to, you know, these pieces of information just get float, float past you from time to time, Herdy. And I was just curious, and um, we didn't get a chance to speak to, to Macca about it yet, um, yesterday, but I, I didn't realise that um, our, uh, our CEO, the X-Man, had his own segment um, talking about the uh, Sanfield Football uh, League when he was over there and... Um, from all reports, um, it was a high quality segment that he used to run <laughs> weekly about the uh, how how things were going and particularly how he was going uh, on and off the uh, field over in uh, South Australia. And um, I, I, I'm hoping that we might be able to find some sort of snippet of audio before the show finishes and footy gets back. Um, but certainly Bruce had heard about it and and he'd listened. Um, Intently each week to to get X's updates on uh, on Southall Footy, but we just didn't get a chance to ask him about it. So. It's very, I could, I, could t- I just I could just see you two. I could see you sort of coercing there. I just knew something like that was coming up. It was actually a, it was a music and football show, so we got to play a bit of Pearl Jam and a few other things. I think it was almost an assignment for university, to be honest. On the famous Coast FM over there, I think we had about twenty two listeners every week. Thanks, Joe. What was the show called? Sorry, Xavier. I can't remember what it was called. I think it was just the Sanford <laughs> footy update, wasn't it? No, no. Joe, what was it called? <laughs> I think it was with the X Men. The X Men. It was not. It was not. over you, mate. We just had to. Wow. The X Factor. Uh, <laughs> this going to be some digging now. I'm going to find out who that was. No wonder he's sounding so natural on the podcast. He has experience as a radio host. Who would have thought? All right. Oh, this wow. is. Um, Don't worry, Joey. Joey at the back uh, is who is producing this. He's already trying to find it, so we'll see how we go. Um, But this is uh, the feature interview, as uh, we said at the start of the show. Uh, Both uh, Job and uh, also Herdy caught up with Bruce yesterday, and uh, well, James, uh, you got to speak to the doyen of sports broadcasting. Thanks, Whitey, and yes, we have uh, Bruce McAvaney with us. With us, um, it is a privilege to have you, Bruce. So, thank you very much for joining us and the whole Essendon audience. And and uh, really, the first question to you is um, really how are you handling 
lockdown and, and the, the last eight or nine weeks in the coronavirus environment. I guess like everybody else, guys, it's been a challenge. Um, so my wife, Annie, and I were in Sydney for the start of the year. We went up there, a big move from Adelaide to Sydney for seven months because she had a job with the Channel 7 Olympic office and I, the work I do, I can really live anywhere and we were there for, you know, three and a half months and that all finished, obviously, with the cancel or the postponement of the Olympics. So we got back into our motor car with our little dog, Frankie, and she sat in the back and we came back to South Australia, stayed at Wagga on the way home and Tully Buck, which is what we did on the way up. So it was all a bit of an adventure. Got back to South Australia, got stopped at the border, got checked, made sure that we were permanent citizens coming back in and what reasons were coming back in. So it was all a bit different. So we lobbed an hour out of Adelaide where the River Murray meets the sea. It's a beautiful part of South Australia. Got a little shack down here and uh, did two weeks of quarantine, which was pretty challenging, particularly when you've got a dog that wants to go for a walk. And then um, and then we've been down here for the last sort of five or six weeks. So, yeah, very different. Um, but I've been keeping busy because I've had horse racing telecasts to be involved in. So I feel like I've had a good purpose to keep going. So it hasn't been too bad. Um, Bruce, thank, thank you for joining us. Um, I remember um, sitting in the, the pre-season sort of commentary um, organisation for Channel 7 and we were talking about, this was back in February, so things were sort of still a little bit unknown, but th- I remember you being asked about, um, you know, the uh, difficulties that had happened in the past with, you know, Olympics and, and how the Olympics had always managed to, to go on in, in some trying circumstances, you know, in the early um, 20th century. And, um, you know, you were really sort of uh, excited about the, the Tokyo Olympics. And I was just wondering, um, you know, how it's been the, the shift and the, the change for you since um, the expectations of what you would have been preparing to do and, and now, um, you know, what you're faced with in terms of that being cancelled and, um, and how that's been for you? It's made a fair bit easier. I mean, obviously there's disappointment um, and you do get yourself organised. Not quite like an athlete, but you certainly put the hard yards in. Um, so that there was that disappointment, but I didn't want to go to Tokyo with a ad hoc Olympics. When you have these events, you really want them to be the full Monty. Now, I've been to Olympics with boycotts. The first one I went to in 1984 had a big boycott and went to another one in 1988 that had a bit of a boycott. So you want everybody there. So it became obvious pretty quickly, actually, that they couldn't go on. And if they did go on, they wouldn't be the real thing. So that made it so much easier. And the other thing for me, and I think for anyone else that you know loves sport you want the athletes to have a chance to prepare properly, and they weren't going to get that. So it became a sort of a, a decision that was easy in the end, even though I guess the International Olympic Committee resisted that for a while. So I felt, OK, not for this year, um, but for next. Now, I haven't stopped working on them. I mean, today, talking to you guys, I've probably done three or four hours on them because I've had a chance to get my head into them. So I'm still working on them as if they're definitely going to happen next year. And my enthusiasm is not thwarted at all, but that disappointment of not going to Tokyo this year was, I think, it was a sober, it wasn't It wasn't that acute because you realise that had you gone, it wouldn't have really been 100% Olympics and you, you only want to go when, it's, when everybody's got a good preparation and a real chance of succeeding. And Bruce, talking about the Olympics, uh, the first time that I ever, I think, from memory as a young child, heard you call was the 84... Olympics and uh, and your your passion and your your ability to to research and be pinpoint. I think it's very obvious to all listeners now how much research you do, but the, the passion that comes across in your voice. But my memory from the '84 Olympics and probably '88 was was your call of Carl Lewis and your passion around Carl Lewis. How does how does Carl Lewis and, and the '84 the '88 sort of era sit in your uh, historical mind and, and your memories of um, Olympics gone by? And James, it's like yesterday, and, and and you know, first love type of thing, first one you go to, and, and I'd seen Lewis, I'd hosted the World Athletics Championships the year before from Australia, and I'd seen Lewis there, and that was really the first time I'd seen him. He was going to go in 1980. Uh, he wouldn't have been a major player, but the Americans didn't go; they boycotted. He would have been on the relay team, but you knew he was a different beast, and I, you know, to see him in the flesh, and then there was so much publicity about whether or not he could do what Jesse Owens had done in 1936, and 
and win the 100, the 200, the long jump, and the 4 by one So to see him in that superb Coliseum Stadium, 90-degree heat, blue sky, he was a beauty to watch. And um, no, it was an incredible thrill. And then four years later, I'd been to the World Champs and called the 1987 final when Ben Johnson beat him. And that build-up, was it was a bit like Joe Frazier and Muhammad Ali. It was, you know, it was an amazing build-up for Ben Johnson versus Carlos. As you guys know, that, that final in 1988 was actually the day that Hawthorne played Melbourne at the MCG, so that's pretty unusual. And it was on at about the same time. But, no, very rich. I mean, I think in the, of all the freakish athletes I've seen and called, Lewis was certainly... I thought he'd be number one forever. And then you, you get others that come along, but Bolt probably went past him, but just without going on too much, Lewis achieved two pink diamonds at the Olympics, and that's he's the only person I know to have done that. He won four gold medals at one Olympics, but he also won the one event over four Olympics. So only one man's ever done that in athletics, and that was a discus thrower to win the same event four times. And only one man's won four gold medals at one Olympics. That was Jesse Owens, and Lewis did both of them. So that gives you an idea where he sits in the history of the event. I mean, it's quite an amazing achievement, and we've been watching. Obviously, the, the Jordan documentary has just been on TV and just finished last night, and a lot of the listeners would have watched that and talked about it, and will be getting through it. And the one thing that comes out about Jordan is, you know, great athlete, you know, hugely successful, but a, a temperament that you know, quite a not not selfish, but it, maybe it is selfish. What was um, Carl Lewis's temperament like? Was he a, a similar type of athlete that had to be very much all about himself to succeed, or, or was he a bit more giving than maybe a, a Jordan comes across in those documentaries? James, it's a great question because in 1993, I spent two weeks in the United States with Stephen Phillips, who's no longer with us, so sadly. And the first week was with Michael Jordan's Chicago Bulls, and we did a one-on-one with him, which was quite amazing. Um, so I, I went to two matches, went to the rooms, spent time with them, and then went from there with Stephen down to Houston and spent a week with Carl Lewis. So at that stage, Lewis, uh, what did he won? He'd won uh, seven Olympic gold medals, um, mm. maybe eight. No, eight he'd won. And, and, and Jordan was uh, the biggest the biggest man on the planet. Um, and Nike was going through this incredible growth. So they were similar. Um, Jordan had a an air about him that was remarkable. Um, mm. We walked out of, we walked out of the... Um, change rooms after the first match and I had no eye contact with him at all and we were walking and he looked at us and said I'll talk to you tomorrow why not and I said yeah and I thought wow he knows who I am you know it's unbelievable <laughs> but the pride that he had in himself and his his sort of belief that he could make a difference was mm. remarkable um and I could go on about him forever um and then I went down with to do the Lewis story and Lewis was training with two or three other Olympic champions. And it was quite amazing how he was king of that pack and just <laughs> knew it and had that strut and had that air of confidence that he could overcome anything. I've always believed the greatest sports people, and look, I'm talking to two great footballers and, that have achieved a lot, but the greatest sports people are those that are not intimidated, respectful, yes, but not intimidated, and have a pride that drives them in a way that mere mortals like myself um, don't have in terms of uh, of that competitive edge in a in a on field sporting sense. And certainly mm. Jordan had it more than anyone I've ever met. And Lewis wasn't far behind him if he was behind him. Bruce, it's it's incredible, you know, insight into um, you know what you've done and who you've met and um, these just sporting icons. I was just wondering. I know you have uh, uh, such a love for the equine industry, and do you, did you ever feel when you were around any of these champion racehorses that they had a, sort of a, an aura about them that they they displayed something of any similarities? You know, where, where Winx was around in a parade ring. Did you ever get a sense that um, there was that uh, sense of um, you know invincibility about her, or that um, that she had something, uh, some sort of quality that was similar to any of the, you know, athletes that um, you were just talking about? Look, it's a, it's a good question, and, and I can't answer that 100% with hand on heart, but my feeling is, yes, they, there is a feeling. Now, horses are a herd animal, and they, 
And a lot of them won't go past other horses, and a lot of them are quite happy to run second and third, but there are others, and, you know, Winx is a, an incredible example of that because of what she was able to do over such a long period, that won't lay down, refuse to be beaten, uh, know that they're the best of the best. And when she did walk around the parade ring, maybe it was the fact that we knew it, and then we looked inside of that and wanted extra from her, but I did feel that about her. And there's been other horses have been famously, you know, horses like Gun Sin back in the 1970s who would stop and prop and wait for the fans to give him a big cheer and then he'd move on. Roy Higgins would sit on his back. And I've, you do see horses that have that superiority. She was remarkable. I mean, I, I, you know, I can't express how fond and how much I loved her and it, it's hard to put it into words. But, yeah, I, I, there is there is this sort of aura there's an aura that the very best has, and um, you know she was that, and I do feel that jockeys have got it, um, even trainers. Uh, but and that often I think that calm in a trainer or a jockey with his hands or her hands certainly transfers to the racehorse, and, and off they go as a partnership. So yeah, no, it it, it is. It's a wonderful thing over the years. You know, we're going. All of us are going through pretty hard times, and. You know, we're all wanting to connect together and feel a sense of sameness. But the one thing I think I've gleaned over the years, whether it be a Wayne Carey or a Michael Jordan or a Huey Bowman, is that, yeah, they do have an aura about them that makes them pretty special. And, 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 and they're able to use that gift in a way that gives us so much pleasure. And I think, Bruce, that, that leaves the obvious question. You mentioned Wayne Carey, and you know, I've heard you a number of times talk about, you know, He's the, the best footballer that you've seen play. I think I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but you see a, a Carey with that aura and definitely having played against him, he's got that aura and been in the room. You know, when you're, you, you're playing in that same era when, when he walks in the room, he's definitely the, the head of that pack. Has, has a Gary Ablett Jr., a Judd or a Buddy since come close or is he still, you know, well and truly out in front of, of those three? No, they've come close, the Hurdy, for sure. I mean, a lot have come close. Um, I mean, and Gary Ablett Senior, I mean, in many ways, he's probably the most gifted. I mean, Job, your father, I think, would think that. And, and, but for me, it was Kerry. Um, and, but Franklin's rare. He's a rare beast. And he's a thing of beauty, isn't he? Because when you look at Buddy, it's not just what he does. It's how beautiful he looks in yeah. doing it. Now, Kerry, Kerry had a bit of that, but no one's got it quite like Buddy. Um, and Gary Abba Jr. and Chris Judd were extraordinary. You've probably picked just about the three. But, you know, Wayne was followed by yourself, James, and, and then Bossy and Bucks and those types of people. But, look, I think of all the players I've called, I don't think anyone's had a bigger influence on a match than Kerry. Now, I didn't call Lee Matthews. That was, he was before my time. But So that, that's how I sort of... Sum it up. I still believe that he, he's the best footballer I've called. Um, I don't think I'm living in the past. I, I think I'm giving everyone their fair due. But certainly he's surrounded by a whole group of outrageously talented players. And, um, and yeah, it's, it's, always, it's always a good thing to reflect on and, and a great argument. But he, he'll probably always be the one for me, I think. <laughs> It's interesting you, you talk about uh, the herd mentality or horses or wanting to run second, but when you're in the room with a group of those footballers and, you know, Kerry and, and those, he's definitely the one that, that drives the, the room. It's, a, it's an incredible, you know, and it, no one's played footy any, football anymore. It, it is this general sense of the, the Jordan, the, the Lewis, the, the Kerry type mentality where there, there's, there's just one that's a, ahead of the pack for whatever reason. Um, and it's not all, always about what they've done on the field. There's a, a temperament, too, that you can see come with those players. So yeah, it's, it's an interesting comment. But for me, I agree. Kerry just is always just that little bit ahead. But, um, we did know so well because you were so close to him. And, you know, Joe, who, who, what about when you were on the field, Joe? Who was the finest player of that era, do you think? Yeah, I, I think that um, for me, it was it was Franklin could do things that no one else could do. Um, he had uh, a level that I don't think was rivaled. And, and I, I think that he and Gary Jr. are the two best players that I played against. But um, 
but he just looked a lot better doing it. You know, like he, he had this, the, the, he, the way he runs, his size, his athleticism, um, it, it is just uh, a, it is perfect combination of skill, um, speed, agility, and it just, I haven't seen another player look so athletic and so graceful on the field as what Barty did in my time. Mm. Yeah, that's a fair call, I would have thought. Bruce, with football, Bruce, it's, it's, just, sorry. it's just about to come back. and we're Sorry, sorry Joe, just around the corner and hopefully we're three weeks away. And, and we're all talking about the players, how they're going to handle the difficulties, the, you know, the... The social distancing, what how, what their reaction to no crowd is going to be. But as a commentator, you've probably got more weight on your shoulders to, to fill in the gaps in the players. And, and are you looking at the game differently and how you're going to call the game, or are you just going to see how it how it naturally flows? I'm thinking about it, Hurdy, but I, I, it's one of those things. I, I'm going to prepare in the same way as normal. And I did the first match of the season, and it, that was an eye-opener. You know, Richmond, Carlton, and, you know, we all know there would have been 85, 95,000 people there, and no one there, and, and it was very raw and very new, and, and you know, Richmond had the game basically won pretty quickly. Carlton played all right. We know that after half-time, but the game was pretty much over by half-time, and it was difficult. I found it challenging. Um, I felt like I got better as the match went on, knowing when to shut up and when to talk and how much sort of hype to give it. But I thought, gee, this is going to be a big challenge for the rest of the season. Now, of course, you know, two or three days later, it was all over. And then we, we've taken a very deep breath. So now I look to those three weeks' time and I think, what's facing me? Now, one of my challenges also, which is I didn't have that night, is that I'm not sure where I'm going to be, guys. And I'm not... I, I can't really come to Melbourne without coming back to Adelaide and doing quarantine. So this is something I'm discussing with Channel 7 at the moment. How do we get around all of this? Now, is it possible that I could do it from a very remote place rather than just a remote place? So it's going to be a challenge. It's going to be a challenge in a lot of ways, a challenge because there's no crowd, there's no atmosphere. And that is a big thing, a really big thing. Can't be underestimated. Um, And then the other one is not being at the ground. And because... Mm. You spend so much of your time as a caller, I do anyway, of looking off the ball. And, and mm. certainly, A, you want to find every player before the ball's bounced and make sure you know who they are because they run straight at you without the number. It's pretty tricky. And then secondly, you know, you always, when BT's calling, who I'm working with at the moment, I'll always be looking at centre-half back of the balls at centre-half forward. Just, just, you just want to know. And if we're not at the ground itself, which I'm not sure that we're going to be, I don't think we will be, then... It's going to be a massive challenge. So I guess what I'm doing, James and, and Joe, is thinking, okay, it's going to be difficult, but I'm not I'm not intimidated by it. I'm looking at it as a challenge. I'm going to be 67, and I think to myself, how lucky am I? How lucky am I to have these challenges so late in my career that I'm not being blasé, that I, it's not, I'm not complacent, I'm not going through the motions. And I mightn't be good enough to do it. And you know what? I'm going to have a swing. I'm going to have a real crack. And if I can't pull it off, I can at least say I did my best. And that's my challenge in the next few weeks. So I'm looking forward to it. I'm not frightened of failing. I'm frightened of not doing my best. And that's that's the, that, that's the philosophy I've got. It's really interesting, Macca, because there's so many people out there who are faced with such hardship in their own lives. And, you know, we're talking, um, you know, to the Essen and football audience, but there's it, it translates and transitions to everyone in society. And, and that attitude that you have um, about not, not being afraid of, um, you know, not, not being great, but just not doing your best, I think that it is so important for people to, to remember um, when they are going to be faced with such adversity out there. Um, I just uh, wanted to, to get your thoughts on, you know, the S- Essendon and, and the year and the, the footy club and, and where you see the, the side. Um, obviously, it's it's really difficult to know how a team's going to come out of this um, period and then go into the season. But I just thought your take on where the Bombers, where you saw the Bombers going into the 2020 season prior to the circumstances that we've had. They're one of the great enigmas. I mean, you guys are so close to them and you've had such a part of their history for someone who you know I, I'm, I 
I'm objective rather than subjective when it comes to all the 18 clubs. Um, they're a tricky team to assess because I call them a fair bit and their best is good enough to be very dangerous. Um, and we all know that premierships can be won by teams outside the eight. Uh, and premierships can be won by teams that just make the eight. Um, you know, that experience of going to Perth last year, what does that do? Um, does it hurt or does it really help? Um, I I feel like if you said to me, pin a spot for them, you'd think six to ten. But I don't, you know, it could be much sharper than that at the top end and it could be a bit lower because that consistency we haven't seen. Now, the club's been through a lot and you guys know better than anyone. The club's been through a lot and there's got to be a residual with that. I mean, you just don't bash that off and move on. That hangs. I feel like it's dropped off now, though. I feel like it's a, a group that can attack this season, you know, without the residual. And I, there's talent. There's a lot of talent there. Everything has to go right. No big injuries. You'd love Danaher to have a big season. You would think that would make a difference. But, yeah. So in answer to the question, I think they'll just get into the eight. I don't think they'll win the flag. But they are capable of getting very dangerous. You know, the coaching situation's interesting. You know, that handover, how that operates, I reckon it's going to be smooth. I don't feel like it's going to be disruptive. On-field stars, leaders, call them what you like, people that, I guess, lead the other team, and we've been talking about leaders, you know, in terms of that aura. I think there's enough of them. I believe that. I hope there is. So I think always interesting Essendon, big club, huge support, great passion, incredible history, um, and due, due for a good one. So I'm excited. Uh, You know, I'm excited about the club's prospects, but like everybody else... I couldn't be confident in saying where they're going to finish up this year. Yeah, Bruce, I think we're all excited. I think we're all waiting for... It's been a long time since we won a final, so we're all waiting for... I think we have got the right people in charge to do it. But um, the other thing that we've been trying to do on this show is just for a guest that have come on, is just talk about a time where things haven't gone as easily as, as we would have hoped. And I think... Um, you know, I remember back in 2000 or 2001 when Channel 7 lost the rights... Um, to the AFL, how did you handle that as you know a massive part of your life and you know people out there who are losing jobs or lose a bit of their identity? Did you, how did you handle the fact that all right you weren't going to be calling such a, a big part of um, a big part of your life and had been for such a long time? It's a good question, and, and you know in many ways it was the making of me. Um, I'd had a, you know what could consider a lot of opportunities, including you know, <laughs> seeing Michael Jordan, and not but. Um, I'd had lots of Olympics and lots of great opportunities. I'd had so many opportunities up until that point. So 2001 was our last grand final. And it was, you know, which way do you go? Um, so I, it was difficult. It really was. And I, you know, I could have dropped my bundle. Um, could possibly have, you know, thought about jumping ship. But none of that happened. I didn't want it to happen. So... I guess once I'd settled down, I approached it in this way. I thought, no matter what happens in the next five years, I want to work hard, as hard as I've ever worked, if not harder, and I want to be ready for any challenges that might come my way. So I ended up hosting Channel 7's coverage of rugby. So I hosted the World Cup rugby final, which was an amazing event. You know, Johnny Wilkinson's you know, drop goal and all that stuff. I mean, God, what an experience that turned out to be. So, I, And I got to meet, you know, George Gregan and John Eels and all these blokes on a personal basis and spent time with them. So I got to learn another sport. And I was still involved with Olympics. So all those things were happening in, in, in that time. I went to Athens to the Olympics and, and we got back into horse racing. So it wasn't like I was not doing anything, but I, I maintained my enthusiasm for footy, certainly my passion. And I, I, I worked very hard, um, but I feel like I became less selfish. Um, when I came, when we got back into the footy, I do feel like I became a better team man, and, and mm. I felt like I grew up a bit. Um, I felt like I was less self-centred. Now I'm being pretty honest and raw here. I haven't said this mm. probably 
before to too many, but I felt like I was um, a more mature person. And I think having that five years away from the absolute most important thing that any broadcaster can do, I think, in this country, and that's to call AFL football on a regular basis, what an opportunity that is, um, and to have it, you know, not have it for five years. And then, you know, and during that time, I've had ups and downs at work. I've fallen out of favour uh, a few times. But there have always been challenges, but I've always believed in my ability to um, keep working hard and to try and improve. So I sort of, I sort of go back into my core and say, what's important to me and what's important to me? It's only one thing in the end, besides family and all, which is the most important thing. But as a broadcaster and a professional, in the end, I have to satisfy my own wishes and wants. And if I do that, I can cover everything else. So Malcolm Blight says a lot of things, and I listen. And many, many, many years ago, he said to me, um, you know, he'd always tell his footballers, never look at the scoreboard, never look at the scoreboard. And that's the way I've sort of approached my broadcasting career. And that five years off, I really got what he meant because... I'm not there to be in the limelight, and I probably was when I started off because I loved it all. You know, it's hard not to, but mm -hmm. I really just want to be a good caller, and, that, and that's what drives me. So I grew up a fair bit, I reckon, in that five-year period, but I got strength from, I guess, my own hard work, ups and downs, and a self-belief that wasn't arrogant, I hope, but was strong and mm -hmm. held me in good stead. I think it's a great message, Joe, for you know a lot of our listeners who have either lost their job, had their 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 hours reduced, or you know some part of their identity has been taken away. In that, you know, getting back to the basics of of hard work and believing in yourself. But I love that bit about being less selfish. I think that it's um, when you really get challenged and you really look inside yourself, you can go one or two ways. And becoming less less selfish, Bruce, I think, is a, a really good uh, message for our for our listeners. Now, Bruce, if we can keep you for another um, couple of minutes, we've been running a competition on our website um, sponsored by AMARC, and the competition, which you are perfectly placed to judge, is a um, is we've asked people to call in and commentate some of the great bomber moments. Um, so normally we get Job to decide on this, but I think you've slightly you've just got him covered uh, <laughs> on the judging role. So the, the, the three are a, a tip and woody goal that Dwayne Paisley's calling. The second one is uh, the Michael Long goal that Nick Davis is calling. And the third one is a Watson goal by Hamish Solberg. So if we play all three um, and you could tell us the best one, uh, we'd be very much appreciated. I'm all ears. And Graham to bring it in and what a hoof it is. Straight into the middle of the ground, Dustin Fletcher. And now Denham, he's picked it up off the back of the pack. Hands over the top, Michael Long. He's got a bit of space to work with. Gets the handy Shepherd. He's got a paddock. Long, he keeps going. He's closing in towards goals. Can he finish on grand final day? Touch of the line. Is it? Is it? No, it's not. Stephen Silvani pleads with the goal umpire, but the goal will stand. And Michael Long, what did we just witness in game 102? He's put the Bombers ahead. 2-3-15. Carlton just a single behind. The Bombers go coast to coast. And Michael Long, one of the greatest runs we have ever seen on Grand Final Day. Bombers up by 28 points. And there's the boundary throw in taken by Hill. Beautiful little hand pass to Watson. Watson busts through a tackle. Soon from the boundary line. Watson! Great pickup. Puts the afterburners on, takes one bounce, kicks him long, fumbles over the top to Orazio. Orazio kicks long to Stringer. Stringer's up, Stringer drops a mark, Laverde picks it up, handball, handball to Tippin Woody, Tippin Woody from the impossible angle, Tippin Woody, he's done it, you little beauty, goal, says the umpire, Tippin Woody, look at that pickup, look at the gather, the quick snap. In it goes, Bombers 86, Kangaroos 81. You little beauty, Tip and Woody does it again. So 
So, Bruce, the first goal was the long goal. The second was the Watson. The third was the Tip and Woody uh, goal. They were all very excited. What was your uh, favourite out of the three of them? <laughs> I've got to say, <laughs> they're good. <laughs> I felt like I was you know, thinking, gee, I'm taking notes. Um, I'll get to the point. Uh, I'm going to go for the Job goal. It, it, the long goal had more to it, and um, I feel hard doing that, but... Just the conclusion to the long goal, uh, to the Watson goal, I thought was just superb. So, I reckon he absolutely nailed the last four or five seconds. So, Job, stand to attention. I'm going for your goal. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bruce. I think what what it's shown is that uh, there's a there's a whole legion of people who have uh, watched and listened intently to your calling over the years, and they've just <laughs> picked up little bits of tidbits of advice. And and ha- I mean. From a person who loves watching the game and been lucky enough to do some commentary with you, it's, it's amazing how much your influence and, and what you bring to the game, how much it adds to, to the viewing and the audience. So uh, thank you very much for everything you've done for, um, for sport in this country over the years. Oh, pleasure, guys. It's been a real pleasure talking to both of you. I mean it. And uh, all the best of the Bombers this year. Yeah, thank you Thanks, very Bruce. much, Bruce. It has been a privilege. And um, just before we, we say thank you to Bruce, but Hamish Salzberg, Solberg uh, for the Watson Gold, congratulations. And thank you to Amart for supporting that segment. But Bruce, from all of us um, at the Essendon Football Club and uh, Joe and myself, uh, thank you so much for spending half an hour with you. I know there's a couple of journalists out there who will be very upset that you've talked to us because we've been waiting for months the interview so um, we feel very privileged that you've chosen to come on the show so thank you and uh, good luck um, over the next few months and we look forward to Tokyo as well where hopefully we can uh, get to hear you next year good on you boys thanks Bruce So there you go, the big interview with uh, Joe Watson and James Hurd speaking to Bruce McAvaney on working through it. Before we continue on on the show, uh, I think we need to sort of reflect back on that because that was very impressive, Hurdy and Joe. You did a great job. Oh, yeah, well, we really enjoyed it. I mean, what, what a man to, to talk to. I think, you know, Joe um, brought up something before we came on the air about one of the questions he would have liked to have asked around the fact that, now, how does he view journalists these days and, and how does he view journalism and how does he view commentators and, and people interact with players? Because the one thing I will say about Bruce is he has respect through the whole playing ranks of the AFL. I've never heard a player uh, speak disrespectfully about Bruce and it's always been in a, in a, in a, in a very, held in very high regard, which I don't think there'd be many commentators around the world in their sport that, that could be said for. Yeah, I think it, it, it's sort of an iconic uh, figure of Australian sport, isn't it? And I think it, it goes, um, you know, it was really interesting to talk, to hear him talk about, you know, um, the humility that he discovered when things were a bit difficult for him. And I think the message to everyone is that no one ever sort of just lands on top of the mountain, do they? There's, there's a huge amount of work that goes through to get to, um, the level that he is, and, and he's never satisfied. You know, he, he even when in, in this period he's talking about, you know, like I'm still practicing on, on on focusing on what Tokyo might look like in in 12 or 18 months time. I'm I'm working on how I can continue to improve. And um, as someone who's just a, a, at the top of his craft, and and for people out there, it's just it's through hard work and dedication and that mindset to. Or constant improvement, and it's just um, it was wonderful to hear him talk so honestly and openly about himself. Yeah, totally agree, Joe. And interesting, one of his big concerns in the next three or four weeks is how he's going to commentate the AFL, um, or it was. Um, but he's just texted through to Dave Barham, our producer, and said he's not as worried about it as he was because now the X Factor is based in Melbourne, <laughs> um, he can take over. <laughs> From uh, his commentary role. So, you know, it's great that he's uh, put so much faith in you. X, Factor? Chris, should we call you X or Factor? Or we could, well, I'm, I'm just confused. You're going to be wearing a few he's hats back. this year, Xavier. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. There's going to be a lot of preparation before the next episode too, Job and James, which I look forward to. <laughs> but uh, one thing I would say about Bruce, he's just so authentic, isn't he? He's, he's a real deep thinker. He's really, he's, he's found his calling up to sort of use a pun, but he just, he's clearly just so, I think Joe used the word craft, like he's just really, he's top of his craft, he knows his craft, he's just he's so genuine about what he's doing, he's, he's great to listen to. 
All right, questions uh, for the guys aren't too far away. So 0416 90 50 52. Don't forget, the best five uh, will all get, thanks to Coles, $100, $150 Coles uh, gift vouchers for the best, best text messages. So 0416 90 50 52. That's what you've got to do. That's not too far away. Uh, but also a reminder that there's plenty of great content on the website you're listening to us on now, essendonfc.com.au, including Adrian Dodoro's now world-famous uh, Dodcast. Uh, you've got to get involved uh, with that. Uh, but uh, we need to take a bit, a bit of a break, and the mighty moment's not far away. It was round 16, 1993, a famous moment when Kevin Sheedy waved that jacket. Um, James Hurd, can we find out from you what the hell Sheeds was doing? How did that all come about? Do we actually know? Uh, it was something to do with Mick Malthouse. I think Mick had, Mick had pointed to him or said something. Or yeah, Sheeds has actually told this story, and I should, have, I should recall it, but he... Um, Mick pointed at him or said something when we won. Um, yeah, he waved, his, he waved his jacket. And, you know, they were the reigning premiers in 92. We'd gone over to Perth in round one that year and lost by, you know, a kick. Um, and we were really, you know, the baby bombers. We, were, we weren't expected to do that well at all. And I'm sure Mick looked over him and said something half through the last quarter. And then he just he, he lost, uh, lost control, I think. And the funniest part of that whole story is that his mum, Sheed's mum, rang him that night. And just you know went through him. She basically said, "Kevin, enough's enough. You're embarrassing the whole family. You might have been down to footy, but seriously, can you can you can you settle down with the antics? Because the family's getting a bit embarrassed. But but it set up a, a great rivalry, and it set up a, a magical moment that um, is replicated whenever we play West Coast to win it by by their fans, or uh, when they win. By, sorry, by our fans, and when they win by their fans. It's one of my favourite Coles mighty moments that I think we've done during this series because. It's such a, it's not necessarily an iconic moment, but it was seen as quite a pivotal moment. It was late in the season. It was round 16, as you said, Essendon, as, a, as the baby bombers had just defeated the, the reigning premiers. Did you feel after that that, you know what, we could actually do something special uh, for the rest of the season? Yeah, look, it was interesting because the, the senior players, as a young player, you don't really know what, what to expect. The, the hype, the energy, just the energy to come off that game was, was quite sensational. But the senior players started to believe that we had a team and that's what gave us the belief. I think, you know, Paul Salmon, Darren Buick, Mark Harvey, Gary O'Donnell, these guys, David Grenvold, really just started to, to talk about what could be if we did this, if we did that. So I think that was the game that the experienced heads got belief in the cohesiveness and the, and the group, which then translated onto us. But, um, you know, I, but those days at the G with, you know, uh, in that, Back end of 93 were, were pretty special times. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Xavier, we've got a, a special guest. It's, his name is Trevor Tans. He's part of the Western Australian Bomber Group, and uh, it's a fairly significant phone call. Can you explain a little bit more about this, Xavier, and, uh, and welcome Trevor to the program? Yeah, it's great to have Trevor. I, and I've met Trevor. I've known Trevor for a number of years now, an extremely passionate Bombers person. Heads up the WA Bombers, as you mentioned, Whitey, and they have been... Um, Pillar of strength over there uh, in my entire time as CEO, but more, even even longer than that. They're just a fantastic group. And when we announced the Backer Bomber campaign last week, um, I think the next day, within less than 24 hours, um, Trevor and the WA Bombers came forward and wanted to commit $10,000 from their various fundraising efforts over there at the WA Bombers toward the Backer Bomber for those members that might be suffering financial hardship to ensure that they can continue with their membership in 2020, which is just a, a massive effort from Trevor's team. So, Trevor, it's great to have you on, on the line. Thanks again for your generosity. It means an enormous amount to the football club. No, oh, thank you, Xavier. It's um, Bruce McAvaney. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. 
Now, how's the group going? I mean, you guys, are, we're all a bit starved of football, but surely there's some excitement, obviously, for your group now, knowing that football's not too far away. Yeah, it's been a bit of a strange uh, start to the year because it's usually a pretty busy time once the footy season starts. We, we had our AGM in the lead up to round one, and then everything changed. So, in some ways, it's been a bit quieter because it usually takes a fair bit of your time out of the week. But um, yeah, we're really looking forward to footy study. Now, Trevor, you you do look a lot like Daisy Williams. That was the first thing I noticed when I first met you. You're, you're still running with a little bit of the mullet. You've got you do actually have a nice tan. You you very much look like the famous number two that had playing for our football club. How often do you get that? Um, no, no, I never got Daisy Williams. I used to get <laughs> I used to get Warwick Capper in my younger days, which was I felt was a bit of an insult, but <laughs> but uh, I'll take that. <laughs> Good on you. Well, mate, on behalf of everyone at the Essendon Football Club, I want to say thank you again. Can you please pass on heartfelt thanks to the rest of the WA Bombers? You've got a massive membership base over there, and you guys have been you, you're huge. I mean, you can see uh, every time we play over there in Perth, um, massive contingent behind the goal, spread across the ground, and we really appreciate all the work that you guys have done. Oh, well, thank you. That's great to be able to to be able to help out. But just, as you said, it takes a bit to, to raise those funds. There's a lot of raffle tickets. But uh, we also need to thank our sponsors and some of the past players that we're involved with that uh, contribute prizes for raffles and options, etc. that uh, make, make our job a lot easier. Trevor, um, firstly, thank you very much for the donation to the club and, and helping out the other members. Joe, but I just had a quick question. I know you're based in Perth um, and not South Australia, but any chance you ever heard the X Factor report? Um, Nathan Campbell's um, summary of, uh, of footy in South Australia or the surfing industry or the music campaign? Unfortunately not. I've heard a few references to it because I've been enjoying listening to the podcast, but I must have missed the source because I'm not quite sure what the content is. We're going to do some digging and find the actual source of it. Uh, <laughs> if anyone's listening and has heard it, could they call in? Because we'd like to really get a, a backdrop of what it is. Okay. Thank you, Trevor, for, for your support. Because the members are the lifeblood of this club, and um, you know there are some people doing it tough, and it's just a fantastic uh, gesture by yourself and, and the group and the WA Bombers to um, to do that for the the um, back of bomber campaign. No, that's a pleasure. I think there's probably twenty percent of. Essendon members are outside of Victoria, so it's uh, it's important mm. that uh, you know we're, we're one remembered, or two able to contribute. And I, I was just doing the sums. I think there's about one member in WA for every kilometre between Melbourne and Perth. So um, there's, there's a significant number, and a significant number of supporters that aren't members. That um, so I think there's an opportunity there. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I, I just just quickly, why I just would like to say one of the great things about playing for the footy club was the support that you had when you travelled. Um, and no matter where it was, um, you know, like it is such a big, um, you know, shock to, to, to go to an opposition, um, you know, game and then hear the roar from the crowd and know that there's so much support and uh, it makes a huge difference. So I know that um, if you're over in WA, you know, it might be a maximum of two games a year that you get to come to. But the support that um, you, you do give to the, the football club and the players, it certainly doesn't get um, unnoticed by players, especially when we're at, at games and, and during games. And so, yeah, just um, thank you very much for um, for everything that you do. And I know it's not the same exposure from inter- uh, being interstate, but um, it's certainly gr- greatly appreciated. All right. Thanks, uh, Trevor, okay. for being Thank part you. of the... No, no problems at all. Thanks for being part of the program. Okay, we're going to wrap up the show with the text messages. Uh, we promised them at the start of the show. We've been going for a while, but uh, obviously Bruce was uh, such captivating listening. We had to we had to keep Bruce going as, as long as possible. Incidentally, uh, the winner... Uh, Hamish has actually texted in to say um, thank you for the awesome show and uh, and uh, he's a bit humbled uh, and honoured at the fact that uh, Bruce, his idol, has uh, has picked him as the winner. So thanks, as I said, also to, to Amart for being involved in all of that and Hamish is the winner. Now, the text message is, are you ready? You've got to give really short, sharp answers, okay? This is very important. And uh, it's fair to say that, Xavier, you've got quite a few questions to answer here. So uh, we'll go through them, and then the best five will win the Coles vouchers. Um, this one isn't in the best five, but it's in the best ten. Do you think no crowds negates any home ground advantage? Go, I'll go to Job for that one. Yeah, I think that they do. I, I think that they will make a big difference. Um, supporters make such a big difference, and playing with uh, supporters in, in a home crowd, I think it does make a big difference between um, playing – for interstate clubs or travelling and being in Melbourne. 
All right. So hopefully that answers that question. Uh, this one for Herdy. The the ruck situation at the Bombers uh, this year. Have we done enough to improve that situation uh, for it to become a strength in 2020? Yeah, I, I think we have. Um, obviously, you know, Young man coming in from Carlton, uh, Xavier. You'll, you'll correct me. Um, just Andrew Phillips. Andrew Phillips, yeah. Phillips has come in, so I, I think we have. I, I think the only issue is if you get a couple of injuries. I mean, the, the difficulty with Ruckman is you can't carry six or seven on your list because you, you just you, you don't have that depth to do it. Um, so you really need to, you know, have, have a couple of senior guys and then a couple coming through. So so four at most. Um, because what happens if you have five or six men not playing, they want to leave anyway. So it's a very difficult um, uh, balance to, to strike, but I, I think we have um, got that balance right. But, but that, that is really, Tommy's going to have to carry a fair bit of weight. And, and I also, I'd imagine that Tom's the sort of guy with his knees, the way they were, that you know he'll probably play two or three games and then a week off. So um, we certainly need some backup there with, with the guys we've got coming through. All right, a question here for Xavier. All these texts are coming through on 0416 90 50 52. Hopefully, Xavier can answer this question because it is around uh, grand final tickets and memberships. My question is in regards to the grand final uh, where I've been sort of guaranteed with three family memberships. So if Essendon make the grand final but fans can't attend, can those grand final tickets be applied to 2021? I need to come back to you on that, Wally. It's a good question, though. There's a lot of things I don't think we've, we've necessarily thought about. That might be one that we have, yeah. um, but I need to come back to you. I'd be hopeful that um, by the time later this year that fans are able to attend, but um, it's a good question. Scenario planning is king at the moment. Okay, so I'll ask you another one. This one is actually the question, and this is true, for the X Factor. I'm just reading what the text says, and it says here, what would you say to community football and netball clubs trying to keep morale high and people engaged in your club. Current club president in country Victorian would love to know Xavier's insight to keep a club together. I, this, will, this is a really good question. We're going to give a $150 voucher for this one, thanks to Coles. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I actually had a conversation the other week with someone from my home footy club, Echuca Footy Club, and um, they're going through, obviously, they're in the same boat as everyone else in the community, and they've just been creating platforms, really quite smart platforms around trying to help keep their sponsors together, so having information sessions there. They've been having platforms where they've been keeping all of their key leaders together and also obviously general sort of social events for the football club online, which is sort of, which is a nice piece. I think it's sort of, and we do this through country game, is an acknowledgement of how important the role is that people play, people in the country play to our community, play to our country more broadly, the primary industry and things like that. But when you think about the country communities, like the fabric of the community, the netball football club generally is it the heartbeat of a community, a football club, and you know, ensuring that the sponsors around the football club continue to support the club in the ways that they can, a bit like the members of the of, uh, of AFL clubs and things like that, because it's particularly important to help with the rebuild. Um, but I've got no doubt that country footy and netball will remain strong because you know the, the values of the country people is such that they will continue to support the people through a really difficult time. We see that in drought. We see it through a lot of the challenges that farmers have more broadly. Um, but I think they'll be they'll be they'll be fine. I'll beat a challenging period at the moment. Okay, uh, that's a good an- good answer. Really good answer. Now, a question here for either Herdy or or, or Joe, maybe for both from Scooter and Heathmont, who's a, I know a big fan of the show. Assessing Dyson Heppel's tenure as captain, uh, what would you be focusing on, James or Joe, about Dyson sort of taking the next level as a leader as opposed to a player? Well, I think that what Hep, Hep has been able to do has been um, excellent over you know the, the years in which he's been captain. I mean, the the club has been to two final series. I know that um, they've been unsuccessful, but there's been a, a lot of change that he's had to try and um, steer through. Um, I think for, for him, it's being about being out there as much as he can. I think that um, obviously he, he leads incredibly well by example, and that's what the players gravitate towards. Um, and, and I think that um, part of his role will be continuing to lead from the front, but also building the, the leadership models underneath him as well so that um, he's helping facilitate the next level um, and the next leaders coming through underneath him so that there's that, um, that smooth transition and that continuity that we see with successful organisations where the, the, the next people just um, step in seamlessly. And I think that that is a really important part of anyone in, uh, in the leadership and, and with HEP um, as well is 
being able to, to get his body right and being out there and then also helping to, to guide and pass on the wisdom and knowledge that he's learned to the next group of younger leaders, you know, whether it's Andy McGrath or um, Orazio Fantasia or Devin Smith or Zachy Merritt, those guys um, will will need a lot of help and guidance. And I think that that's an important role in someone in leadership and certainly for help. All right, Hedy, we'll count this as two text messages because I think it's it's important to get your view on this one with Heppel. Yeah, well, like I think the first, I agree with everything Judge said, but I think the first thing Hep needs to do is just to make sure he's on the ground. Um, I think his body probably hasn't been as, as good as he's wanted to be over the past 12 to 18 months. So um, getting him super fit and, and not worried about the injury concerns, I think is really important. And I know that I know the question was about as a, a leader, not as a player, but it's very hard to be a, a really good leader, an effective leader, when you, your body's failing you and you, you're playing with an injury cloud. Or I know he played a lot of the year last year with a sore foot. So getting himself you know, fit so he can play week in, week out, because then he can influence and impact on the ground and off the ground. And you know, I think Hep's a really easy guy to follow, to lead. He, he's natural. Um, he works his backside off. No one works harder. I think that, you know, probably the, the next iteration in Hep's leadership is, is is to be a bit harder on his teammates, I think, and, and basically say, OK, this is what this is what I stand for. And uh, and if you, you step outside these guidelines, then then, then it's not acceptable. And, and, and I think he's, he's getting there and I, I, he's just such a high quality person and that I think um, he will get there. And he, like Joe was, um, he'll be a person that, you know, all his teammates follow and uh, and hopefully for, for Hep and, and the rest of the team they can see some success on the field and you know, he can he can lead them because I, I do think he's a high quality individual. All right, uh, a few more. Um, this is for you, Herdy. And I actually like this question and it's not because you're Superman, you are James Hurd, but how did James Hurd slow down time when he had the ball? Uh, slow down time. I didn't feel that way when I was playing on Mick Martin. He was ripping my head off in the... Yeah, every time he played North Melbourne, but um, uh, it's interesting. I didn't, I didn't have a lot of um, interesting. Listen to Blake talk talk about um, athletic capability. I didn't have a lot of speed, um, and so one of the things that I was good at, and I think Blake was good at, was was reading the play and making early decisions um, before other players. And so, uh, interestingly, and I, I'll so I'd, uh, digress a little bit. But interestingly, when Mark Thompson and, and Brendan McCartney came to the club as coaches, what they did is they actually put a decision tree up around how you make early decisions um, in defence and in attack and from a metre away from the ball, from five metres away from the ball. And it it never been explained to me how players make decisions and enabled me to reflect on my sort of game a little bit and worked out that one of my skills was really looking at looking at a contest and making a decision from the cues that the players were moving or or the ball where it was bouncing on how to um, how to move and where to move, and, and I think that one of the things I did well as a player is I just moved slightly earlier, like a millisecond earlier than a lot of other players, which gives you a little bit of space and a bit of time, um, and and enables you as a player that didn't have a lot of speed to, to maybe get that extra time to to get rid of the ball. No, I reckon it's a really good question. I'm going to put that down as a $150 Coles voucher. Okay, quickly, three more. So we get the 10 as promised. Uh, for Job, who was a big-bodied midfielder, there has been a bit of obsession with Essendon fans and members, and I, I kind of agree about having that big-bodied midfielder. And the question from Ken from Inverloch is, could Mason Redman, Aaron Francis, or Patrick Ambrose fill that brief potentially for the Bombers? Um, oh, look, I, potentially, um, I think Mason um, has continued to develop really well as a halfback flanker, and I really like how he plays in that role. I think he would probably be more suited to a wing than um, inside mid. Um, and I also think that Aaron would probably be more suited with his aerial prowess, again, to being in more of a halfback flank role. I think that's where he's going to be suited most. Um I think that the the biggest key for me and, and uh, for Essendon is the balance of their midfield, is getting the right people complementary um, assets to which players have in there together. And that's about um, you know who who is the speed, who is the agility, who is the um, who is the 
the finisher, who's the connector. And that's the key for the midfield for, for what I see for the football club. Um, whether or not it's an inside midfield or an outside midfield, it's looking at the strengths of those players and how, as a collective, when they're in there together, do they become most effective? Um, and that's what I think that the club should be focusing on rather than just trying to turn someone into a big body midfielder. It's about what do we have? And how can we best get those guys to complement those each other to be most effective? Okay, well answered. Okay, two more. Xavier, this is for you. And this is sort of reflective of or representative of a number of text messages. Uh, Joe Danaher, what's the latest? Obviously, John Worsfold spoke yesterday. Uh, there was a medical report that came out on the website on Monday from a CEO's point of view. How's he going? Um, where is he at? And I think even more importantly, how's his mindset going as we, we are, what are we now, sort of mid to late May? Mm. No, it's all, I mean, it's always going to be a, a longer road for Joe, obviously, and that was something we've spoken to over time. But um, the reporting on it's been probably a little bit extreme in the sense I think Joe's, uh, um, Joe has made uh, tremendous progress over the last period and during this break and up to, you know, I think Wush has said up to sort of, Ten days ago, he was he had some significant running sessions, a lot off the line. He was doing some some really great work, but they want to build Joe up so he's robust and he's sustainable and can can create continuity in his play. And it's not something that you want to be sort of two games on a game off. And that's sort of where they're at the moment. They're sort of building his body back up, and there's a lot more positive to it than negative. Um, and I feel like as as much as there's still some challenges, two steps forward, a step back, I feel like Job's, uh, Joe is making good progress and um, uh, I'm more excited than not about it all. We might expand that conversation a bit more next week because we are running short of time. But this is the last question and this is definitely getting a $150 Coles voucher. I love this question and it's, it's for Herdy or Job, I reckon. Speaking in regards to The Last Dance, which was the documentary on Michael Jordan, who had the Jordan mentality in your respective groups? And also, if both of you were Jordan, you'd both love to be Jordan, who was the Scotty Pippen in your group when you were playing? I love this question. This is great. We'll go with you first, Job, and then Herdy can have the, uh, the final say. Well, I think for me, you know, Herdy was the most competitive person that I'd um, played with. Um, so he had that competitive element that, um, you know, like that Jordan had. Um, and, and I think that uh, um, Angus Monfries was one of those guys who was just like a competitive animal, you know, like um, – and uh, and he was he would just compete on everything, and uh, we'd always get into fights with players and, thing, and his teammates just because he was so competitive. Um, but I, I think for um, you know the, the balance and, and who was the, the Scotty Pippen of um, you know, probably didn't get. I mean, I think Fletch played his whole career probably being slightly underrated. You know, like he just the expectation that he was going to be great and do his job and playing in such a tough position. He he played and was a very sort of quiet character, but um, internally was um, just loved by his teammates. Um, and uh, and I think that he played his whole career sort of being that Scotty Pippen type um, player for the football club. Okay, so that's uh, Job's view. And Herdy, you can finish it off. Yeah, uh, look, I'll take a different, slightly different tack and look at the forward line um, through my career or most of my career and, and two guys that the most competitive guy I played with was, was Matthew Lloyd. Um, he was super competitive um, in an internal way. It didn't obviously it didn't come out sometimes externally, but every I mean you just looked at him before a game and, and you just think, my God, this guy is just intense. He's he's going to he's about to explode, and and then he went out and did his thing, and and, and you know he he really wanted to be successful and drove himself to be successful, and and then there was Scotty Lucas who who was similarly competitive but just a bit more relaxed. So. They're not not exactly an answer to your question, but I think if you if you look at if if Lloydie hadn't have been there, Scotty would have gotten more accolades. Um, but Lloydie was there, and Scotty was a sensational player in his own right, and won you know a couple of best and fairest. Um, but Lloydie was you know still seen as the, the premier forward of the time. So if you, the best analogy for me was you know, Lloydie was the the, the Jordan and, and Scotty Lucas was the uh, Scotty Pippen. But um, as the Jordan documentaries highlighted, you can't have one without the other. And uh, that's why they're so successful. All right. And the final word from our text, 
Jimmy, Job, and Professor X, you have made my afternoon great. Thank you. So that's almost the final word from our Essendon fans and members this week, as opposed to Xavier, Job, and also James. Hey, Whitey. Yeah. Whitey, just quickly, are we changing the name of the show? Next week. Oh, well, I think it has to go into the, it has to go into a production meeting type setup. And uh, <laughs> Xavier's, walked Xavier's walked out. Xavier's walked out. We'll uh, we'll have to speak to Dave Barham about that, and uh, he can have the final. Dave Barham and Sean Wellman, the two people behind <laughs> the the creative lines of this show at the moment. Well, you've certainly we'll gone over time. There's no doubt about that. It's almost like a mini series. It's gone that long over two nights. But uh, <laughs> I, I, just according to the text messages, there've just been so many of them. It's great to have uh, the involvement of so many S and fans uh, who have uh, clearly been engaged with today's uh, program. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. We'll do it all again next week. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Okay, James Heard, Joe Watson, and also Xavier Campbell. We will be back next Wednesday for another edition of Working Through It as the AFL season for 2020 it gets closer to resumption, and that's exciting, everyone. There's no doubt about that. We'll catch you next week. Enjoy the rest of your night.